Great. Hi, everyone. Um, it's an honor for me today to introduce Professor Sharon Rustin to all of you. Professor Rustin is Chair in Romanticism at the English Literature and Creative Writing Department at Lancaster University. She has published The Science of Life and Death in Frankenstein in 2021, Creating Romanticism in 2013, Romanticism and Introduction in 2010, and Shellian Vitality in 2005. She co-edited the collected letters of Sir Humphrey Davy for Oxford University Press in 2020 and currently leads the AHRC-funded project to transcribe all, the, all of the Davies' notebooks, which sounds a very ambitious and fascinating project. Um, the title of her talk today is The Humphrey Davy Notebooks Project, and coming to the end of uh, four years of crowdsourcing transcription of Sir Humphrey Davies notebooks. Today, Professor Sean Roston will reflect on the discoveries that have been made and the joys and pitfalls encountered. Davy was one of the foremost British chemists of the 19th century. Nearly 3,500 people around the world have been transcribing his 83 surviving notebooks funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK using the platform Zooniverse. So, Professor Rustin, it's all yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm now going to attempt to share my screen so that you can see my slides. Oh, let's go back to the beginning. How's that? Can you see them? Yes. Yes. Good, 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 good. So, thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you, and I'm delighted to be talking about this project, which is since 2019, I should say, because that's when the pilot project started, nearly three and a half thousand volunteers, as has been mentioned, have transcribed 11,417 pages, if we take it all into account, of Sir Humphrey Davy's notebooks. Davy was one of the most famous chemists of the early 19th century in Britain, but he also wrote poetry, and his notebooks are filled with both scientific experiments and poems, sometimes on the same page. So in this talk, I'll first tell you a little bit about Davy. Um, I hope that you don't all already know this. Some of you will know it, I think. Why we might be interested to find out what's in his notebooks. And then we'll discuss the notebooks in more detail, plus presenting some of the recent discoveries that we've made on the project. And finally, I'll tell you a little bit about the project and how we've gone about it. And I'd like to take this moment, particularly to acknowledge the other members of the project team, um, particularly research associates, Dr. Eleanor Bird, Dr. Andrew Lacey, and Dr. Alexis Wolf, and the many thousands of volunteers of whom we have one here, known to me as Deha, um, who is here with us, and uh, who all of those people have helped me to write this paper um, because there are things in here that uh, that they I identified, and also Andrew Lacey also helped me with some of the slides as well, particularly the, the kind of technical ones. So Humphrey Davy, here he is, born in 1778 in Penzance. He came from relatively humble origins and was initially apprenticed to be an apothecary. But these plans changed when, as a precocious young lad, he showed a real talent for chemistry. He was appointed to superintend the new medical institute at Clifton in Bristol two months before his 20th birthday, so very young. And there he became the first person to inhale nitrous oxide. At the time, nitrous oxide was believed to be fatal if breathed. So this gives you a bit of a glimpse into the kind of man that he was. Um, and, uh, you know, breaking news in the UK, nitrous oxide on the 8th of November, it became a criminal offence to possess nitrous oxide. So there's a very up to date kind of uh, glimpse into how it's thought of now. Uh, the Pneumatic Institute in Bristol was run by a rather infamous man who was a thorn in the government's side because he was in the favour of the sentiments of the French Revolution. This is Thomas Beddoes here. And he had married one of the novelist Maria Edgeworth's sisters. Um, so it's a quite an interdisciplinary household, a very busy household with friends who shared their political views, um, who also joined together to try this new wonder drug, nitrous oxide. And this is a cartoon uh, from 1829, showing some poets writing verse under the influence of nitrous oxide. 
In this youthful period, Davy seems to have been quite the radical in his politics. Mm-hmm. And this changed, changed very much as he got older. It was an early notebook that first caught my interest when I was doing my PhD many years ago, and it contained for the era inflammatory notes on materialism. Writing in 1797, a 19-year-old Davy puts forward the materialist case that the thinking powers depend upon organisation. These notebooks are a maze of crossings out, pages cut out, and additional supportive or angry conflicting comments. Davy clearly read them again later in life when his views were very different. And it's fascinating to see how his ideas change and develop. So you can really see that in the notebooks. So even in this notebook, he notices later, um, these observations were written at 16 and a half years. What a revolution, in my opinion, since that time, now 19 years. So he feels himself that he's really changed in that time. Despite what we would he would later claim, it's apparent at this point in his life, during this time at Bristol, that he was a materialist. The notebook shows that he believed that the mind depended on, upon the brain. And his vitriolic denunciation of Christian dogmatism in these pages is particularly re- re- revealing. Tracing the idea of a soul back to ancient Egypt, Davy accuses crafty priests of inventing the concept so that they might make men more subservient to their ends. The next passage reads like the words of a radical materialist and atheist. Prejudice should never lead us to believe theories which are absurd and contrary to common sense. The body is a finely tuned machine. The young Davy then is a Republican, advocating this as the most perfect form of government. And he portrays the state of Britain in recent years as a mighty nation groaning under the chains of tyranny and sustaining the pang of oppression. At this time, when Britain is at war with France, such opinions are distinctly dangerous. Davy could have been arrested and transported for such sedition and blasphemy. In Bristol, Davy became good friends with the radical poets Robert Southey and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He was clearly like them in his politics and in other things. uh, Coleridge is very famous as an opium addict. Um, I think Davy became not a little addicted to nitrous oxide when he was at this period in his life. The older, much more conservative Davy is embarrassed of his younger self, and we can see his attempts to revise and obliterate the evidence of the earlier radical young man in these notebooks. We can see Davy's experiments with nitrous oxide as they unfold in the notebooks, how much he takes, when, and in what kinds of prepared situations. I love this uh, bit here, which he writes under the influence of nitrous oxide in very large handwriting, Davy and Newton, clearly very self-aggrandizing there, um, maybe when he's not in his proper state of mind, after inhaling seven quarts of nitrous oxide mingled with atmospheric air. Uh, Maybe shows you a bit of Davy's idea about himself as well. On the 26th of December, 1799, he recorded in a notebook that taking nitrous oxide makes him feel as if he has become a sublime being himself. He was interested in comparing the effects of this gas with alcohol and records in one notebook, on December 23rd, I breathed after a terrible drunken fit, a larger quantity of gas, two bags and two bags of oxygen. It made me sick. He devises an experiment where he drinks a bottle of wine in eight minutes and quickly follows this with five quarts of nitrous oxide in an attempt to find out whether the gas will help with the headache caused by the wine. It didn't, if you were thinking of uh, replicating this one, it just gave him a headache as well as the, um, the, the hangover he had before. So the young Davy then can be seen in these notebooks in all his glory. After a particularly enjoyable session with the gas in April, his notebook records, I cried out. So I'm particularly interested in this here because it's crossed out, cried out. So he's almost kind of presenting himself in a particular way. Because if he's, he's just writing to himself, why why do that? Anyway, so I, I cried out, but cried out's crossed, crossed out. I said to myself, I was born to benefit the world by my um, great talents, etc. And the notebooks reveal then that Davy wrote lots of poetry as well as making scientific experiments throughout his lifetime. He only publishes a handful of these poems himself, mostly anonymously. So for the most part, these poems haven't been read or considered. And there's still a good deal of research to be done on these. I've I've promised a 
the first um, edition, selected edition of his poetry. Um, so we're still kind of going through and working out what's worth publishing after all the stuff in the notebooks. So in the notebooks, lines of poetry jostle for space on the same page sometimes as accounts of chemical discoveries. Notebook page pages torn, stained and burned reveal that Davy wrote poetry in his laboratory while at his scientific work. The notebooks offer us the possibility of moving beyond the so-called two cultures of the arts and sciences. Davy uses two methods, poetry and chemistry, in an attempt to understand and express the world as he sees it. He writes the same kind of poetry as his contemporaries and friends were writing, Orientalist epics, odes, poems about the sublime set in the Lake District or about Mont Blanc. And one early notebook, 13F, contains an idyll, an ode and an epistle demonstrating the range of genres that he used and tried out. He even wrote a poem about the experiences of taking nitrous oxide. Um, after a bruising battle to prove that he was the first to invent the wire meshed miner's safety lamp rather than George Stevenson, Davy wrote a poem titled Thought After the Ingratitude of the Northumbrians with Respect to the Safety Lamp. So I'm interested in why he chooses to write poetry, how it allows him, I think, greater emotional freedom to express himself than that formal uh, published scientific writing. Davy's notebooks allow us to see the man himself, his thought processes, character portraits of his eminent scientific contemporaries, his to-do lists, his shopping lists, lists of his reading, and his private undiluted opinions. So Davy is credited with the isolation of more chemical elements than any other person has isolated before or since, including some very famous ones. He did this work at the Royal Institution of Great Britain in this very imposing building, which still stands on Albemarle Street in London. He used the new science of electrochemistry to isolate elements such as potassium, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, barium, and boron. When he first isolated potassium, his cousin Edmund, then working as a lab assistant, reported that he actually danced about the room in ecstatic delight and that Davy needed some time to compose himself sufficiently in order to continue his experiment. So we found the actual pages then that where these experiments took place. Um, there are some 20 pages of notes on these experiments in lab notebook six. And in the middle of these accounts of these experiments is an address which has been traced to George Lynn, a tailor. So the research associates who worked on the notebooks have speculated that Davy wanted a new outfit for his prestigious Bakerian lecture that was coming up where he would announce these discoveries. We learned from notebook entries at the time that Davy experimented with the names sodarchium and potarchium and sodogen and potogen um, as before kind of alighting on the names that we know now. At the Royal Institution, Davy became known as a charismatic and popular lecturer, one of the first and most successful scientific communicators of our time. And many middle-class women attended these lectures. Which is quite unusual. The notebooks contain many of Davy's lecture notes and these have the potential for us to recreate the experience of being there in his audience as he spoke. So Coleridge for example attended Davy's lectures in order he said to increase his stock of metaphors for his poems and Davy's bombastic rhetoric in these lectures can be found almost word for word in the lectures of Professor Baldman in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So I've got much more on the connections between Frankenstein and uh, Davy in the book that came out in 2021. Here's a shameless plug for that book, um, the, life, the Science of Life and Death in Frankenstein. Um, I very much believe that uh, Davy is the model for Victor Frankenstein in, in the book. Um, as Richard Holmes, I'm not the only person to say that. As Richard Holmes told us in his book, Age of Wonder, Davy's lectures were so popular that Albemarle Street became the first one-way street in London because carriages had such trouble getting to the, to the uh, venue for on the nights of his lectures. While most of Davy's notebooks were private and personal, there are a few that are not. The lab laboratory notebooks kept at the Royal Institution, such as Notebook 07, is very much a public object. 
It was not, not in fact ever supposed to leave the laboratory. Its role is to record the experiments that have taken place in the lab each day. These experiments might be continued over many days and weeks and be taken over by different people. So they kind of, you know, people will just say what's happened that day and then someone will continue it. And apparently this practice still goes on now in labs. Um, they're very large books, these ones. So they, this lab notebook, 07, contains many different hands and it runs to nearly 700 pages. So it's a gigantic thing. Davy, who didn't always play by the rules, I think you all know that by now, used to borrow these lab books and take them back to his rooms. As this later note written by Davy's one-time laboratory assistant, a certain Michael Faraday makes clear, Davy was in the habit of taking the notebooks away and continuing to work on the data producing them at his leisure. This resulted in some of the notebooks not being returned to the lab until 1829 with this note. Ironically, in another lab notebook, we find an annoyed Davy chastising his lab assistants for their treatment of the communal notebooks. In this entry for September 13th, 1809, he tells his co-workers that cleanliness, neatness and regularity are the most pride ob prized objects in the Royal Institution Lab. And he proceeds to write that pen, ink and paper must not be kept in the slovenly manner in which they are usually and he bemoans the state of the pen and ink that he's using. Um, but you can see on the page that this has got terrible smudges of ink on this page. And that might confirm his claim, perhaps. But given that it's on the page, presumably after he's written it, um, the, the, the Davy Notebook project team have wondered whether the lab assistants paid no attention to what he was saying, or uh, there's different. we could read it all different ways. Um, but these lab notebooks then were supposed to be located in a specific place and not to be moved. And they tell us then a lot about the circumstances in which Davy worked and lived. But some of Davy's notebooks are intensely and intimately private, presumably intended for the writer alone to read. And as with all handwritten manuscripts, it's the crossings out, the insertions, the corrections that often reveal more than the author themselves perhaps intended to reveal. It's intriguing to read someone else's notebooks, especially when there is material present that may not have been intended for anyone else's eyes. You can get a real sense of the person, I think, their interests, their hopes, fears, day-to-day -day life and plans for the future. Excuse me. On page 24 of notebook 13D, Davy uses his notebook, as we all do, to plan his working day. Whether he achieved this le ambitious level of industry is not known. He writes, resolution to work two hours with pen before breakfast on the child of crossed out, lover of nature or the feelings of Eldon from six till eight, from nine till two in experiments, from, uh, from four, to, four to six reading, seven till 10 metaphysical system, i.e. system of the universe. Quite the day he's got set out here. This resolution reveals a number of interesting things, primarily perhaps that his poem was important to him, but it's also less important to him than the work of the main part of the day, admittedly that for which he's being paid, which is his scientific experiments. Other people have suggested that maybe than writing the poem first in the morning before breakfast, that might be the best time that you have for writing. And maybe that's the thing he wants to do, he enjoys the most, and that's why he's put it that way. So there are different interpretations of, of that page, but um, whether he actually managed to do all these things in, a, in a one day, I don't know. The notebooks sometimes have a one particular focus with, with whatever Davy's working on at that time. So we've got lots of notebooks on agricultural chemistry, for example. But others have a huge mix of topics and kinds of writing within them. So, for example, 15S has the usual mix of poetry and lots of other things. There are scientific experiments, but there are also quotations. So lots of Francis Bacon in this one, but also John Milton and others. Classical and mythological references. Cicero, a reference to Orpheus. And contemporary scientific references. 
So William Nicholson, for example, an entry in the encyclopedia is mentioned. In 15F, again, Davy notes that he needs to write to Lord and Lady Beaumont. They were the patrons of Wordsworth and Coleridge. He mentions various geological theories, such as the Plutonian, Neptunian and the Hutonian theories. And there are lists of monies owed to various people. Some, I guess, we'll never identify. Um, but yes, often lists of uh, figures that he's working out his private finances as well. While he uses this notebook mainly in 1805, he returns to it again in 1822 when he's trying to draft his speech as president of the Royal Society. So that's interesting as well. There's there's different um, later Davy using the notebook again. There are intriguing references to politics here to the Prime Minister, William Pitt. Pitt's public parts, the greatest. And as you can see on this page, there are sketches of landscapes, often sketches of faces. In 15F again, there is there are drafted contents for his forthcoming geology lectures, but also sketches of the gun barrel that he wants someone to make for him. There are philosophical musings and many themes recur between notebooks, such as repeated discussions of pleasure and pain. So for example, in 15F, pleasure is enhanced by pain, but not pain by pleasure. And Davy is obsessed with the man of genius. This person is often figured as an abstract elite, he, often with a capital, and clearly Davy identifies with this man. So in 15F, for example, he writes in a poem that the man of genius will devote himself to serve the public and ignore the loud applause of multitudes. But we also get moments of first person resolution, apparently heartfelt from Davy himself, such as this. Never will I complain of destiny or praise my fortune or exult in pride. I can't tell you that he, that was, that he didn't do those things, but uh, clearly he's trying to um, live his life in a particular way. So there's been some important work published on scientific and laboratory notebooks and on li literary notebooks, but people haven't looked at them together, I think, on the notebook page. So that's one of the, the things that we're doing, um, I think, first. The process of transcription has also revealed attitudes to race and connections to transatlantic slavery that we didn't know Davy possessed before we did this project. So one of our RAs, Ellie Byrne, is particularly looking at this aspect and writing an article on it at the minute. There are numerous musings on the differences between poetry and science. That's a particular area that I'm interested in. Um, and I'm hoping that having full access to the notebooks will give a better sense of how Davy and his world thought of the two. Um, I hope that the results of the project will give us much more sense, not just about Davy's life and work, but also about his world. And he's often in, uninhibited in these notebook entries. Um, reading, them, reading them makes you feel like you get closer to the man himself and to his ideas, which he may not have published or spoken out loud in his lectures. I also think notebooks are interesting from a methodological um, perspective as well, because they're not finished often. They're, they're kind of because they're often drafts, sometimes they end up in uh, publications, but often they don't. And that's quite, so I'm quite interested in whether we need a different approach for looking at those kind of uh, forms. So now to talk about the project. You can find out more about our findings by following us on social media. We've got Twitter, X or whatever it is, Facebook and Instagram. And since the transcri transcription stage finished on the 1st of November, we've been editing volunteers' transcriptions and annotating them. So volunteers on the, the Zooniverse platform, this is what it looks like, um, continue to help us even now. Um, I'm thinking of, of the online edition of the notebooks at what I'm now calling a crowdsourced edition, because really the volunteers have come up with so much of the information that will go on there. Uh, volunteers aren't just helping to decipher difficult words at this stage. I mean, so they helped us to transcribe the notebooks, but now they're helping with particularly difficult words. Um, they're also doing research as they have been doing the project. So identifying people and places, chemical processes, scientific ideas, literary and other kinds of quotations. The final images of the notebook page and the transcription plus the notes will be published on Lancaster Digital Collections, hopefully in the coming months. 
the pro the platform we we used was called Zooniverse. It's called Zooniverse, and it describes itself as the world's largest and most popular platform for people powered research, with over two point five million volunteers from around the world. It started with science projects, specifically with astron astronomy, but there are now a number of transcription projects. But apparently ours is the biggest transcription project that Zooniverse had attempted to date. Um, and lots of other ones have followed us. Um, and we were able to help Zooniverse to make some changes. So for example, uh, we helped them to, we paid for a tool, which meant that they could then use consecutive pages, which you couldn't do in the pilot project and you could do. And that's really good because it means that other projects can now use this too. So during the transcription phase, we presented our volunteer base with high quality uh, images such as this one here. All of Davies manuscript notebooks are held in archives in London and Cornwall, so they're not particularly accessible to people. So one of the, the things this is going to do is, you know, obviously make these uh, manuscripts much more accessible generally. The first uh, transcriber draws a line under the text they will transcribe, as you can see here by that pink line there, and then enters the text as they see it, remaining as faithful as they can to Davy's original spelling, punctuation, um, abbreviation, and so on. And you can see we've got some text modifiers there, so you can show something's been deleted, inserted, is unclear, underlined, or superscript. Subsequent transcribers then click on the that line, that pink line, and they can see the uh, previous transcriptions that have been made. So they can either go along with what's been said before by somebody else, or they can change their mind and write a new one, um, depending how they interpret the text. And we started off by gathering three transcript transcriptions per line, and that was the case for most projects, um, eventually just to one. Um, when we were sure of the quality of the transcriptions as well. Um, so th this is therefore a highly collaborative project. Um, people are kind of building on each other's work um, and volunteers have spoken about how much they enjoy being part of a larger project with the other volunteers, but also with the project team itself as well. So after the volunteers have, have come up with something, there'd also then be a stage where they, we will edit um, the project team will edit and we're all work, working towards this common goal and it has felt uh, quite lovely to kind of be involved in it. So transcribers are encouraged to share what they've worked on and to offer comments or ask questions using the talk function which you can see here um, and it's like a message board uh, thing on Zooniverse. It's their forum feature and message and the project team are on hand. We we, mess, we check it every day um, to kind of comment on what people have raised. And this is often where people share what they've learned with us, such as identifying people, places, chemical processes, the quotations that Davy uses. And this is a good example of the latent talent of the crowd. We have practicing physicists, retired chemists, working um, teachers of science, as well as literary scholars and all kinds of people um, helping us. So everyone has a particular area of expertise. Um, not only do our volunteers provide us with a very sound base text for editing and enriching, but they also directly feed into our interpretation of Davy's text, which from feedback we've gathered so far seems to be as genuinely satisfying for them as it is for us. Through a very impressive algorithm, Zooniverse is able to aggregate the transcriptions we gather. The three transcriptions are automatically compared and so Zooniverse's algorithm presents a project team during the first stage of editing with the best approximation based on what the transcribers have submitted of what the line of Davies text actually reads. So three be lines become one line, a line of consensus text and you can see there, there's a consensus score given down the side. So you can see whether everyone agreed with each other or there was some difference of opinion. You can see we've even gathered more um, volunteers lines. See that one that says six out of seven there. I think that happens when people disagree. Um, the level of accuracy is astonishing. The aggregated transcriptions before any editing takes place 
therefore present us the project team and uh, Davies editors with very a very satisfactory base text to work with. Um, so we use Zooniverse's collabor collaborative text editing app, which is called Alice, stands for Aggregated Line Inspector and Collaborative Editor, to see the lines marked up with volunteer made marks, as you can see here. And if you click on one of the lines, you get the three individual transcriptions, um, so you can check what people have thought, how they've disagreed. And there is a line from Deha, who's with us today. Um, and then you can see a close up of this in the next slide here. Um, and there's an aggregate, the aggregated transcription is made from these three. So we could have done this project many different ways, but we chose to, chose to crowdsource it. Uh, partly because there's a lot of latent talent out there. Um, our transcriber demographic, as we found from our post-pilot survey, is predominantly over 65 years old, almost half of whom have a postgraduate degree. We have teachers, medical professionals, librarians, civil servants, industrial chemists, and more contributing to the project. Each transcriber obviously brings their own particular skill and experience set um, to the project. In the last few weeks, volunteers have been helping me, even today, <laughs> with Davies Greek, Latin, Italian, phonetically transcribed German, which is incredibly difficult, um, Slovenian as well, his biblical references, references to Plato's works, as well as archaic chemical terms that are not used today at all, and truly astonishing reading skills. Sometimes these things, that I, the stuff I was looking at today had pencil that had been written upside down by a pen over leaf and it was in French and it was you know it was, it was very difficult stuff um there are of course some ethical implications to consider in making good use of the transcriber community our transcribers put in a huge amount of time and effort in transcribing these occasionally difficult notebooks and you shouldn't approach crowdsourcing as a something for nothing approach in fact, Zooniverse explicitly prohibits this. There has to be a mutually rewarding offer to volunteers. So our project team are a regular presence on talk, providing feedback and encouragement on the work that the transcribers have done. We have held fairly regular transcriber meetup events where our volunteers have the chance to discuss their work with the project team and with other volunteers. All transcribers will also, of course, be acknowledged when the digital edition is published. We've had the results of our um, transcription survey now um, at the end of the project. And it's very heartwarming. Lots of the comments are, are quite lovely. So people talk about how the project helped them with loneliness during the pandemic. We started in the pandemic in 2020. Uh, people being housebound because of health reasons and how being part of something important has been genuinely thrilling for them. And I can't underestimate that it's also thrilling for us. So one of my favorite bits is the volunteer collaboration stuff. It just has been lovely. And I hadn't realized how fulfilling that would be, I think. Volunteers have spent hours with us each day and continue to help us on a daily basis as we edit and annotate. Um, two of the volunteers, one of which is, who is with us today, even learned how to use Alice and are helping to edit the notebooks in these final stages. Another key benefit of crowdsourcing obviously relates to scale. Many hands make light work, as the saying goes. And obviously having this many people transcribe this many pages makes the load much lighter. It just couldn't have been done by me and the project team, this project, because it's just, it's just enormous that, um, how big we were trying to do. So a crowdsourcing project can, if managed correctly, have massive processing power. And because it's a global platform, so the people are coming uh, to the project from all over, it's kind of always on. So, you know, you get a uh, contribution throughout the my night um, and in the morning, there's always more stuff. So we have transcribers from across the globe. Um, and finally, the last thing um, on why to crowdsource. Crowdsource, collaborative transcription produces higher quality results than individual transcription. Um, this is Sam Blicken's research. Um, she's one of the um, advised co-investigators on the project. 
So the very last bit I want to show you is just very quickly, uh, one of my favorite bits in the notebooks. We had this in one of the notebooks and there was nothing written on it. And one of our volunteers took a look at this and I and they noticed the bridge, I suppose, as well. And they identified it as Carica Reed in Northern Ireland. And, you know, we might have got there and actually there's evidence to back this up in the notebook itself. Um, so, yes, I'll leave you there, that lovely picture. Um, there is evidence in the notebook to back this up. So we could we could say 100 percent this is definitely right. But I mean, it also looks like it as well, doesn't it? But they just you know, that was a work of a minute, which might have taken us. I don't know. Could it, we may never have got there, I suppose, as well. So there's brilliant stuff like that. And the very last thing to say is that when these notebooks go on to um, the Lancaster Digital Collections, which I hope will be soon, that is in many ways a beginning rather than an end. Um, it's just it's just another stage in it, because then we will have this amazing corpus of Davies' work and then researchers will do what they will do with it and they'll find out all sorts of other things. So, you know, I'm really hopeful that lots of good things will come from it. And all we are, in a way, what we're doing is just providing a, a, a huge resource for scholars to use for the next years. So that's me. I'll stop sharing there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Watson, for your thought-provoking presentation and on this, uh, on this original inclusive David Notebooks project. I'm sure this presentation will have sparked a lot of interest among researchers. Um, now I would like to open for questions. <laughs>